Good morning. It's, can you guys hear me? I'm loath to lean into the microphone. Um, so, Conservation at the Dolly Part 1, there's a nice clunky subtitle of a brief overview of conservation techniques, methods, and materials, and examples of conserved works in the Dolly Museum collection. This is a very brief and general overview of uh, conservation in general with, um, again, some of our examples from the collection that have been treated. Um, I guess the best preface for this kind of thing is don't try this at home. Um, this is work best left to professionals. And part two of my lecture, I will have some examples of uh, Mr. Morse's hands-on techniques uh, and the best intentions that might have led astray on a couple of our works. Um, we're very fortunate to have had a collector who was very involved with his pieces. He not only purchased them, but did some framing and did some minor restoration work in his little basement workshop. Uh, and he was kind enough to leave notes on the back of several of the pieces, um, which has helped our conservator and it also provided some nice anecdotal information for us in our records. So let me get on my reading glasses here. Ooh. So this is one of the tools of the trade, uh, a nice magnifying visor. Um, it also kind of masks everyone's identity, so you'll see, or won't see, a lot of our conservators next week, uh, in the next two weeks, um, under the guise of magnification. Um, let me have a sip of this lovely coffee. Can I keep coffee going? So off and running, we start a little dry and then we get a little more exciting as we go along. Um, every general basic kind of um, lecture like this usually starts off with a visit to Webster's Dictionary. This is no exception. So a nice definition of conservation, the act or process of conserving is to protect from loss or depletion, to preserve. And then my favorite part is to use carefully or sparingly. This is not a jumping off the end of the dock kind of a thing. This is proceeding very cautiously and um, you know, hesitantly, as it were, no matter what the experience of the conservator is, less is more in, in all instances. So a conservator is a person in charge of maintaining or restoring items. So that kind of gets our definitions out of the way. Uh, again, I am not a conservator. I am going to be helping the team assist mostly with physical parts of the thing. Um, my title at the museum is assistant curator, and that can entail anything from changing light bulbs to writing uh, copy for catalogs to uh, when fortune um, aligns, escorting works of art from our collection to other institutions and in transit. Um, so uh, kind of a dirk of all trades, master of, of some. Uh, this week uh, we've been deinstalling the Huff Gallery. Um, Hopefully you had the chance to visit and see Dolly's mixed media sculpture compositions as well as some of his illustrations. Our next exhibition uh, will share the space. We'll have our two-week uh, live conservation product, uh, project that will turn into a kind of a standalone 10-minute um, uh, video segment featuring some of the highlights and also the Circus of the Grotesque which features uh, prints that we have never shown in this museum or the old museum actually were um, uh, illustrations uh, from Casanova, uh, Pantagruel, uh, Dolly's version of the circus and also two very nice uh, renditions of the classic tradition of bullfighting as seen through the lens of, of Dolly's eyes. Uh, that show opens officially on Monday the 11th, so you'll be able to see two of our masterworks out of the James Gallery in a working space. Um, when you go up today, you'll, you might notice a little bit of difference. We removed the frames from the four uh, masterwork paintings um, over the last two days, so the conservators have full access to them. One of the paintings, the Ecumenical Council, our small one at 8 by 10 feet, is going to get a new stretcher, so that's going to be pretty dramatic. And then in, in taking the pieces off last night, I got some very nice pictures for part two um, showing what happens to works just hanging on the wall with, with in you know, ideal conditions. So off and running. Um, back in the late 90s, 1999 to be exact, the uh, 
museum applied for a conservation assistance program grant and that um, enabled us to, um, with funds from them and matching funds to uh, hire a conservator to come and do an item by item survey of all of our oil paintings. Uh, this was a, a two-phase process that took two weeks at a time. We've got 96 oil paintings at the time. Um, we were very active with our loan program. Um, 99 had a, a major show over in Tokyo that also traveled to Fukuoka, Japan. Um, so we looked at everything that we had on site. When everything came back from Japan, we looked at the other half. I'm kind of cheating a little bit. This is a picture from inside the gallery, uh, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia. We had a loan down there in 2009, but this is uh, an example of what happens. Um, the paintings are removed from the frame, they're put out on a table under bright lights and uh, looked at under magnification. Um, and that was kind of a fun experience for me. I re was really in the right place at the right time with regards to my career here at the museum. Um, I started as a part-time volunteer, uh, moved in through the store, became shipping receiving supervisor. I was also helping Joan in the curatorial department when we did um, minor changes back in our old Raymond James room. And then when we started the loan program, doing exhibition changes out in the main gallery. Um, the pieces, as I mentioned before, were treated very lovingly and with, with care from our collectors, uh, A. Reynolds and Eleanor Morse, but he didn't always use the best methods and materials. So before our first loan from the collection, which was down to the Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale, I um, did very minor intervention, went into some of the frames, removed um, decaying velvet and replaced it with a more stable uh, mat board just to kind of replace that thing. Mr. Morse made a lot of the sh older shadow box frames um, in a conversation with Dolly. Dolly said, I'd like to see all of my paintings. Or he'd like to see them in a, a period Dutch frame, which were kind of cost prohibitive. So you'll see upstairs we've got a wide variety of framing styles. You'll see Mr. Morse's old shadow boxes, a couple of variations that I've done. Um, in addition, we had 32 of the pieces um, custom frames made for them for our inaugural exhibition when we, when we made our move. That was a major project. We've got six more of those custom frames on order. Um, unfortunately, you won't see four of them because they're, going, they're being whisked away to the, the Pompidou and Rihanna Sophia this fall for a, a loan. Um, but we'll get into framing a little later. Um, getting ahead of myself here, so we had our, our two Two sessions. Again, this is our uh, National Gallery Victoria setup. Um, when the works were prioritized, they were given a rating from one to four, one being most urgent and four being most stable. This is our conservation assessment for the oil paintings. Um, 96 paintings turns into about 200 sheets of, of uh, paper. As we get them conserved, we update this um, to date. We've had 25 works conserved. Um, Rustin, Levinson, and Associates have worked on 23 of those. Two of the pieces were taken to the foundation, or rather the Fundacio Gala Salvador Dali in uh, Figueres, Spain. That's Dali's home museum. They had a, a show in, I think, about 90, 95 or 96 that featured uh, Dali's bread paintings. So our two bread paintings, uh, Catalan bread and basket of bread, were hand carried by Joan Croft and Peter Tush over to Figueres um, back in the day when you could do things like that and people didn't want to look inside every piece of luggage that you had. Um, I remember I actually packaged them up in uh, bubble wrap and cardboard, um, so it's been a bit of a learning curve for us <laughs> as we've moved along <laughs> with that. Things have gotten a lot better, but again, we were trying to keep it very low key and you know, not, not, I'm carrying a dolly painting, you know, and it, it gets real tough when you're on a plane for eight hours, people going, what's in the box, what's in the box, and um, Joan was able to ride the little elevator, she, oh, you learn all sorts of secrets about airplanes when you do these trips, so she was able to ride the little elevator and tuck it away into the cargo hold. Um, so on to our current project, in the summer of 2010, um, we prepared an application with the National Endowment for the Arts 
for the NEA Access to Artistic Excellence. Um, that was a in-house deal. Amy Miller, who I do not see in our audience, and I worked on that. She did some of the nuts and bolts, and I provided a bit of the narrative. I, pr I got the quotes for the conservation work. Um, this is what that project turned out to be, and this is the edited version, um, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, we went whole hog on this and looked at what had not been conserved and put in for everything. Um, so we wanted $115,000, but we only got $44,000, um, which we have to match. Um, that is approximately two years of our conservation budget. So we timed this close to the end of our fiscal year to kind of bridge the two years and um, Again, we're only being able to work on these four uh, paintings this year and next year. Um, and then, as part of the grant, they they want to they want they want to see something for the money that they give. So that was the uh, initiative for us to do the in-house, um, no, you know, um, open kind of uh, conservation uh, treatment that we'll be doing. And also, space is an issue. Um, Ecumenical Council is an 8 by 10 foot painting. The other three paintings that we're working on, Galasadalacid desoxyribonucleic acid, the hallucinogenic toreador, and the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus are all approximately 10 by 13 feet in size. Um, these little paintings that have been worked on before were able to transit to and from Miami without any real complications. These are so big. Ecumenical Council fits on a truck sideways, which is less than ideal for the painting. The other works would have to travel at an angle, which is not good for paintings. Uh, we, we kind of ran that risk when we relocated from less than a mile away. Um, but ideally, you want to keep your painting in the position that it sits on the wall. It doesn't like to be moved around a lot. They can be very reactive sometimes. So now we get the fun, we got all the text out of the way. So um, I've kind of cribbed these shots with the assistance of uh, Rustin and her team. This shows conservators at work. Um, this is her New York studio. In a perfect world, um, the conservators slash artists are working in natural light. Um, this is a nice big open studio that she has in Chelsea. I still haven't been able to visit that yet, but um, never say never. Again, um, on the left-hand side, uh, the conservator is looking at the piece with uh, under magnification. That little box is both a light and a magnifier that she's able to, to look at. And then again, our conservators on the right-hand side, both using the magnifying visors to do some of the fine detail work. Um, and again, less is more. What they're probably doing is a little bit of in-painting where you have, have a loss and you see like white of the, the grounded canvas and they use a um, uh, all reversible, um, mostly watercolors and um, just to kind of bring up the aesthetics of the piece. Again, another shot of her uh, New York studio on the left and her Miami studio on the right that we've become rather familiar with um, taking almost two dozen paintings to and from. It, it, it makes for a long day, but um, they usually give us a nice Cuban meal when we're down there. So I always look forward to the Ropa Vieja when we go to uh, <laughs> Rustin's studio. And she's got a great team that she works with. Um, again, over the last 10 years, I've, I've had many opportunities to not only break bread with them, but to discuss our paintings and, and work with them and kind of wrestle with some of those old Mr. Morse frames. So the nuts and bolts, um, It's this is um, the, the title of the project might be a little uh, deceptive. We're not stripping anything. We're doing some very gentle cleaning. To, um, to strip off varnish is much more involved and it's something we wouldn't be able to do on site because of the fumes. Um, with this new building we have actually have chemical sniffers and if they detect any you know kind of noxious odor they'll set off the fire alarm after setting off other alarms in advance, um, but we have to be very careful with fumes and, and off-gassing. So again, it's just, it's basically physically cleaning the works. When we had, um, we had uh, the Toreador and Discovery of America down um, last night, and 
the pictures in August will will tell the story better than I can. It, it's it's pretty gross, actually. <laughs> the um, the paintings were varnished back in the 70s, and they really haven't had a whole lot done to them since then. We've treated treated them with as much TLC as we can. Uh, we put the current frames on them in 2006 after they got moved around with all the hurricane activity around 2004-2005. Um, but the idea of the frame is to, to help kind of break that, to kind of define them a little bit better on the wall. You might note it when you see them today, they, they look great, but they, they need a little more definition, I think, which is what that frame provides on them. Um, and here we are with our friend, the swab. Um, <laughs> a little goes a long way, like I said. Um, these are not Q-tips they grab off the shelf. These are swabs that are made one little roll of um, cotton at a time. That is a, a bamboo skewer like you would use for your shish kebab on the grill. And then um, they work from a bulk roll of cotton and make their own little swabs. Each conservator I've dealt with has their own preferred swab uh, <laughs> format. Some like them thin, some like them fat. Um, I'm hoping to get a nice kind of before and after because it's kind of cute how that little jar fills up with these swabs by the end of the day. And um, also, as you can see in this picture, just just simple water sometimes can make a, a quite a difference. And again, we're not going to be taking varnish off, so it won't be a super spectacular uh, change, but it will be a noticeable difference. Again, we're not doing varnish removal, but it, it's worth seeing the before and after differences. Um, um, some of our pieces are rather heavily varnished and so you kind of need to move around to find a happy medium when you're looking at them in the gallery spaces. Uh, Restretching, we are going to do um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that process. I've seen the small format like we have in the picture on the right hand side um, but uh, just the concept of removing an 8 by 10 foot canvas and then replacing it with a new stretcher um, I think is going to be pretty exciting. And the, um, the processes that we undergo in the next two weeks will be filmed live and then that is going to be condensed down again into a 10 minute loop featuring our kind of um, greatest hits and the most spectacular um, kind of things. Um, and again this is not Rust and Levinson but it could be because you never can tell who's hiding behind the visor. Um, and also with regards to our, our team, I'd like to thank in advance our volunteers who are going to be in the galleries during that two-week process to field questions from our visitors and act as a kind of a go-between. Um, this is a very um, precise and exacting process. Um, and again, we, ha we do have the privilege to see them at work, which is a very rare occurrence. Um, some, I've seen a couple of museums set up kind of glass rooms where the conservators are working um, behind glass. Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has, I think, about three of those set up and working right now. Um, and they usually, again, they're behind glass, so there's no way to, to get at them. They usually set up a board saying what they're doing today, and if it's between 12.30 and 1.30, they're out at lunch. Um, so what we're going to be doing is having a, a, a sheet. People can sign up and ask questions. There will be a question and answer period every day, about 3 o'clock. Rustin will answer some questions. Those will also be posted on our website. Um, again, just to better inform the public as to what, what, what exactly is going on. Um, one thing you're not going to learn is details. They're not going to tell you exactly what they're using. Again, leave it to the professionals. This is not something you guys should try at home or, or anybody should, should try at home. I, I've been working with art and um, framing it for over 30 years, and um, I'm loath to touch my things other than to, to frame them. If I have something wrong with it, I know who to get in touch with to, to treat that. So here's some examples from um, our collection. Again, they're not going to be super dramatic before and after. It's the subtle differences that, that help um, prolong this. Um, my uh, Catalan is not all that good, so I'll revert to the English for uh, bird fish. This nice panel piece from 1928. This is one of the classic examples of Mr. Morse's framing. This is a work on panel mounted to a board covered with velvet. And um, 
And in order to show the entire panel, he used bent metal clips on the corner to hold the panel in place. And over time, with all the TLC you can provide, it's still going to um, cause some stress and de-stress. So upstairs in the gallery, you'll see a very different uh, presentation of this piece. It's now uh, engaged with a frame within a frame, um, much more safe and secure. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, they like to take pictures in raking light. You see a lot more in, in differences of light and, rather than just looking at it straight on the wall. Um, I, I noticed this just the other day in our galleries where we were painting. I was up on the lift and saw something that I thought should be addressed, and when I got down on the ground, it looked normal. So that the angles and, and light make a, a big difference, and um, not only in the conservation assessment, but also for um, the treatment. They get like to get before and after shots in, at various angles. So a little bit of a close-up, and again, very subtle differences. She did some uh, consolidation down at the bottom where um, Dali applied sand and then painted over it. Um, miraculously, with all of our sand paintings, we've had minimal losses. Um, so I don't know what kind of glue he used, but he got his money's worth on that. <laughs> I mean, 1928, and these shells and pieces of the coral are still stuck to that pan. It's, it's amazing. And I've had them loose, and they don't fall, It's thankfully. But it, it's pretty amazing. And then also um, exposing the not only the back of the support board, um, but also the actual back of the panel. Um, on the far left is the support board, and you'll see the notation there, CAT one uh, CAT two four three M seventy one. That's a notation from the first major loan that the Morses participated in, uh, Gallery of Modern Art in New York City, um, Salvador Dali, featuring most of their collection at the time. It was pretty impressive. And you'll also kind of see the uh, old steamer trunk with uh, a bunch of stickers on it. That nice red one is a actual moving company sticker from the relocation uh, from Cleveland to St. Pete many years ago. And then I see, uh, looks like Dolly the Early Years, which was our first um, major kind of loan that was to the Hayward Gallery in London and then the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And it looks like a uh, Sometimes museums will put stickers on, other times transit companies will put them on. Uh, again, part of that learning curve, we're uh, reluctant to have things stuck to the back of the painting, so we, we, we're trying to provide a surface that, that can be stuck on. Um, this has thankfully been replaced since then, um, but I thought it was nice also to see the back of the panel. There's a little Xylos, is an art supply from way back, so Dolly went to the art supply company and, and got a panel and, and created this piece. Uh, morphological echo is another piece that has been treated and again you see the on the on the easel shot with the color bar and raking light. This piece has been treated a couple of times because it's got some issues <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, uh, another fun thing that you see when you remove these uh, paintings from the frame uh, sometimes Fingerprints, um, that's a Dolly fingerprint in paint. We've got a couple paintings that have trapped hairs, um, hopefully from the artist. Um, and then um, re when Rustin examined the font, she wasn't really sure what to make of it. She thinks there might be some organic material um, as part of that composition. So you might want to take a look at that, and thankfully it is under glass, so you don't have to worry about that. Also, Dali has kind of created issues in his own painting um, in order to give definition to some of the composition. He's actually scraped away at the paint, which can weaken it. And then also you'll see in the black areas some kind of ripples and cracks. Um, Dali would go to the art supply company and buy tubes of paint. He also liked to make his own paint out of raw materials. He wrote a book called 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, which you know, it provides some of those recipes, um, some more fact-based than others. Um, but we've come to find out that his his darker tones, his blacks and his browns, are, are rather fragile. Um, when Dali passed away, the foundation in Spain was got everything out of his studio, so they know exactly what he used 
on, on these things. And then two, they, they have in-house conservators and in in, in more of a lab, and they've been able to do some anal, uh, analysis and um, of the works. So when in doubt, ask the foundation, and they may or may not let you know. <laughs> Uh, I've got these reversed. We've got before on the right and after on the left. Um, she just did some minor, minor varnish removal to to get rid of that shiny look and and give us more of a matte finish. But again, those those cracks are not really cracks. They're they're dolly going in there and, and removing paint initially, and then over time as it dries and shrinks, we get a bit more of a gap. So our our main concern is making sure that. These are stable. We don't want anything lifting or flaking. Um, when we are asked for items for a loan, uh, our, our, our um, curatorial team meets. We review our conservation assessment. Um, oftentimes, we've had requests for pieces that we aren't able to loan because of the condition. And a couple of times, those institutions have stepped up and agreed to pay for the conservation, which is always helpful. Uh, Kadikes being a prime example of that. Uh, Eucharistic still life, again, uh, very subtle changes, but um, necessary. Again, as you, as you see in this painting, lots of dark colors, um, so they needed some attention. And again, exposing the back. This, this is a nice one because it shows some restretching. Also, a little uh, sticker from a Paris gallery. This paint, as you can see on the bottom left, this stretcher was totally keyed out. Um, stretchers are made to move, and the little keys help them adjust and expand or contract. This had been knocked all the way out and was starting to cause um, stresses to the outer edge of the canvas. So as you can see in the before and after pictures, um, they actually put new material on the edges as you can see on the right hand side, to help, um, help stabilize the canvas and also give it more, more to work with. Um, it, we're not sure at what stage, but usually you'll see an excess of canvas on the back of the stretcher. It looks like somebody at one point trimmed the excess, which is a big no-no. Leave, leave it alone. I mean, give, it, give yourself some, some stuff to work with. So you see very nice before and after shots of um, the back of Nature Mort of Angelique. Big difference, and the, the painting is, you could almost hear it say thank you. <laughs> when we dropped it off, I, you know, I gingerly gave it to him, and when we, when we saw it again, I just wanted to pick it up and give it a big hug. It looked so good. Um, and again, before, during, and after treatment, and it's nothing major. It's very slight and subtle differences. You know, we're not gonna see black, and white differences. It, it'll be you know more shades of gray from our treatment. Um, sometimes even though pieces meet our specifications to travel, things happen in transit. Uh, the next two examples are minor um, consolidation treatments that were done to pieces that were on loan. This is again National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. Uh, the woman in the picture is Catherine Early. She's the senior conservator She's pretty much the Rustin Levinson of that gallery. She's got over 20 years of experience with the gallery, uh, working on a wide variety of objects. She has a team of, oh, I think about 16 different conservators under her, objects, paper, fabrics, um, a remarkable facility, and um, the, their crew was a, a joy to work with. And then any time I'm able to work with our paintings close up, I, I enjoy that, so this is, taking the painting out of the frame, and there's our ubiquitous swab. Catherine likes to make them a little puffier than others. Um, and then under magnification and bright raking light, she's um, working on doing some consolidation. Because you don't really want to mark things up, she's got a little nice little stick there to show where we're working. And believe it or not, this stuff, this little lift is what we were concerned about. Um, this painting has a has a really weird finish compared to some of the others. It, it's almost like it's been polished down, um, and this lifting area has has been of concern.
for us a couple of times. This is not the first time it's been worked on. Uh, we, we think probably the ground, there's canvas and usually a, a ground layer of another paint and then the paint itself. So we, we, don't, we don't think the ground and the paint are cooperating very much. So we, we like to keep an eye on this. And again, very tiny, very minimal um, work is done on this. Um, she applies a consolidant that again is water reversible and then uses heat to, to make it stick basically. So she's got a, nice, a little heating wand and using a piece of mylar as a buffer. Um, same story with memory of the child woman. We had some lifting. You know, you'll see cracular there in the black area and then uh, a little bit of loss in the key area. This was a very important painting for them to have for this exhibition. This painting was shown in Melbourne in the late 30s and then um, basically lived in Australia during the Second World War. Um, so it was kind of a homecoming for the, the child woman painting. They had um, documentary uh, evidence of newspapers, of little school, school kids looking at child woman back in the 30s, so it was kind of nice to see. Um, so in the process of taking the frame apart to fix the key, we lost some paint. On the uh, upper left photo, we've got a little bit of a loss there. That was paint that stuck to the inside of the, the frame. Fortunately, we still had the paint, so Catherine was able to reattach that. And then when we put it back in the frame, we gave it a little more of a, a buffer. And again, uh, very minimal uh, things. A little bit goes a long way. Um, this is ecumenical council. My main concern was that we were shipping it sideways. So when we shipped it there, it rode one way, and when we shipped it back, it rode another way. This was to kind of equal out the stresses. Um, paintings undergo a lot of wear and tear in transit for the um, loan to Australia. We put everything on a truck up to New York City, and then it got on a cargo plane. The cargo plane went from New York to Chicago, to Los Angeles, to Honolulu, to Auckland, and then to Melbourne. So that's a lot of ups and downs, and that's a trip where I just took my watch off and rode with it. Um, I was able to get off the plane in Honolulu for some fresh air, but that's really about it. So this eight by 10 foot painting is you know, in, in motion. It's in a crate to protect it from something coming at it, but it's kind of its own worst enemy in transit. And um, I, we, we've loaned it several times. It's been to Japan three times, and then this um, trip to Australia. Uh, but Catherine expressed a little bit of concern over the, the motion, and so we did do this uh, intervention with the um, cotton batting. Usually, uh, when a work is conserved, the next step is to put it in a nicer frame. Um, again, Mr. Morse um, had the best intentions and not always the best materials. This is a uh, fountain of milk spreading itself uselessly on three shoes. And uh, we've got our before shot on the left. Um, this is Mr. Morse's shadow box style. And hopefully you can see in the pictures the little nail heads. Um, in order to put the glass in the frame, he used little strips of wood on the outside, and he actually, I don't know how he did this, I, I lose sleep just thinking about it. He would nail into the surface of the frame to hold the glass in place. I mean, <laughs> just, that just, ugh. <laughs> Um, we don't have very many of those left upstairs. We're working on eliminating them. Um, uh, but then, this, as you can see, the package itself with the, fr the, with the canvas in it has a, a gold liner and a, and a silk, um, actually a gold fillet and a silk liner. So a gallery somewhere put that package together. Mr. Morse put it in his um, shadow box. Um, this was one of the first um, four of the 32 frames that we did. Um, we tried to get them in a little better shape before they went up to the High Museum in Atlanta. This, that was the last loan uh, we participated in before our relocation and loan moratorium. And again, just trying to make things a little nicer, a little better. Um, we've got a that backing is coroplast, which is a plastic corrugate. Uh, we don't like to put actual 
Um, they make a blue board that's a corrugate, but in this climate, we don't want anything to be absorbing water that it shouldn't. That little uh, library pocket is our in-house um, tracking system. We can't check out the works, unfortunately. Um, so there's our after in our nice House of Heidenreich custom frame. Uh, when we were starting to plan our relocation and inaugural exhibition, uh, we were looking at some of the frames and on the back of the uh, Infanta painting, uh, we noticed the House of Heidenreich label, so we contacted them um, and started a dialogue which resulted in this, the 32 new frames. Uh, the House of Heidenreich started in the Holland in the uh, mid-1800s and relocated to New York City. It was the framer for Dali, uh, Picasso, Miro, uh, you name it, they've been there. Um, David uh, Mandel, our, our representative there, has a, a file folder like this of Dali correspondence, um, little notes back and forth. Madame Gala paint, picked out this frame. They actually have a Dali style um, that they use, but it's a very thin molding, um, more appropriate for works on paper. Uh, and then we've got two more examples of our conservation framing before and after. This was Beatrice, and Beatrice was always a bit of a puzzle for us. Um, it's actually two frames in one. The outer frame is the wood and the very, very degraded velvet. Joan and I were looking at it and we think Mr. Morse kind of shaved the velvet down for some reason. It, it's got, it had a very weird appearance. Um, so we had the canvas with a minimal liner inside this uh, gold and wood frame and also it looks like Mr. Morse painted silver on this lovely walnut and then tried to remove it from the, this, uh, the wider, wider space there. So best intentions, but not always the best materials. Um, and the front doesn't look all that bad, but when you see the back, you realize it does need a little, little TLC. Um, that's actually masking tape up on the top of the back of the canvas. And you know how masking tape is. It, when it gets old, it either falls right off or it is not going to let loose. And this is one that is not going to let loose. So Beatrice is on um, in the uh, conservation assessment but has a very low priority. She's in good shape. This is more of an aesthetic thing on the back of the uh, canvas that doesn't really affect the overall piece. So it was very nice to get her out of her little hodgepodge frame. So there she is. And then um, in order to frame the piece correctly, you don't want it coming in contact with the glazing. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see I uh, used strips of wood to help support the painting and keep it away from the glass. You don't want to get it too far away from the glass because then you start getting shadows, but you don't want it right on the glass because um, if you have any change in climate, it, it can create issues. Uh, again, thinking ahead of possible um, loan activity, we've got a nice clean slate on the back for them to put stickers on. Also, our little library pocket there so I can take that home for the weekend. Um, and then our after, um, which very, very much, I was very happy with the way this, this one turned out. Um, the, um, the grisaille, the gray um, pa limited palette that Dolly used on this painting was a bit of a challenge, but I, I think the frame suits it very well. Uh, and this, um, I hate to um, have favorites in the collection, but I think this little painting is probably my, my favorite painting. Um, not only because of the title, but the overall the composition. Dionysus spitting the complete image of Catechez onto the tip of the tongue of a three-storied Gaudian woman. Um, I love it. <laughs> the, the title tells it all. I mean, if you've got any questions, look at the title. If that doesn't answer them, look at the painting. Um, we're, we're very fortunate to have the source image for this painting, which was a primer page. Uh, had a bottle, uh, some grapes, uh, different fruit, and some books. Um, in the original, we've got Dolly tracing the, the figures, and then we've got the, the completed oil that not only lives up to its title, but also has references to his fascination with the French painter Millet up in the upper right. 
Again, this is a very small painting. It's about eight by 10 inches. Um, but this first picture shows one of the reasons why we address the framing. This painting, um, after purchase, was framed and mounted by Mr. Morse. It hung in their house and then in the um, Salvador Dali Gallery and then in the museum. But over the course of the last 30 plus years, due to changing light, the fabric has faded out um, considerably. Um, this is a very thin panel too, so it was a bit of a challenge to remount. Um, in this case, I reused what Mr. Morse did. He used very tiny screws to go through and support this piece. Um, so if this ever has the, um, the piece was at risk as it was floating. Now it's a little more engaged and stable. So we've got a before Mr. Morse basement made shadow box and an after uh, House of Hyde and Knight custom frame for the piece. Um, in addition to the frame, we also use conservation glass. Um, with the 32 new pieces, we're using a water white laminate glass. It's two pieces of glass laminated together. Um, if it is struck and breaks, it does not go anywhere. It's not like your windshield glass that's made to break into a thousand little pieces. Um, I, I had to test it. We had, a, we had an extra piece that had an um, imperfection in it. The company sent us a new piece. And me being me, I said, well, let's see what this stuff's made of. It's built to last. I hit it with a hammer as hard as I could. It, it isn't going anywhere. Um, worst case scenario, if we get a wackadoodle up in the gallery who decides he's going to do that, he's not going to do anything to it. <laughs> um, Dolly paintings have uh, an unfortunate history of attracting... Um, touched individuals, shall we say, um, which Dolly thought was great. It got him a lot of publicity, but we really don't want to um, attract that element. So that leaves us with the Peanuts gang in the gallery, um, admiring the art. Um, again, I, um, this was meant to be a little uh, introduction and uh, doesn't have a lot of technical information and might be a little more anecdotal than you thought. But I thank you all for your time, and if you have any questions, please let me know.